Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's lecture. My name is Carla Gonzalez, and I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Jean-Philippe Beymar, who will show you how to use the structural restoration tools in GOCAD to construct an exploration model for vein deposits. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type them into the Q&A or raise your hand, and we'll get to them right at the end. Um, and just a quick reminder that this lecture is being recorded and it's going to be available on our YouTube channel in the coming days. And that's it for me. Um, take it away, JP. All right. Thank you, Carla. And uh, yeah, welcome everyone to uh, this uh, end of March virtual lecture. So they will be uh, talking about the GoCAD mining suite, which is the software that's mostly used by our consulting um, people here, so geologists and geophysicists, to help build model and conduct uh, integrated interpretation. So today's talk will focus on the uh, structural restoration tool as a mean of constructing a, um, an expression model for vein deposits. So the goal here is really to use the output of a SCUA model, which is the implicit modeler uh, available in the GoCan mining suite and um, conduct a structural restoration. So meaning unfolding and unfaulting of the, uh, the resulting uh, faults and uh, model horizon and use that as a basis for a vein sort of a hosted deposit uh, exploration. So really we'll uh, calculate the strains, the dilational uh, factors on the restored surface and use that as a guide for exploration. So here's my uh, starting model here. So I've created a really simplistic model for, for this exercise. And the goal is really to showcase what uh, the structural restoration tool. So what we have in terms of the model here are actually three different components. Uh, so we have two faults that have been modeled uh, here. So the two gray, uh, two gray uh, surfaces that we see here. And then we also have a, um, uh, our uh, stratigraphic contact here, or just a, a folded surface here. So you see that if I remove the faults, uh, this surface is faulted uh, by the different faults at a various degree. So the displacement is not equal everywhere. And you also see that uh, the surface just comprises an anticline, uh, two anticline with two synclines. So basically just a folded uh, contact. So if you were to build that using sort of sparse information or just a regional interpretation of your data, you could then uh, conduct that uh, structural restoration. So what we'll be using um, for, for this restoration is called uh, Kine 3D1. Uh, so it's a, it's a sub package of, uh, GoCAD, of the GoCAD mining suite. And uh, I'll show you how to go through that and how to use the resulting for, uh, or to help explore for uh, vein deposits. So it's gonna be a short lecture, but I think it's a neat little tool that needs to be used a little bit more in exploration. So the first thing we'll do is select the surface we want to unfold or restore basically. Um, and then we'll just hide the other one. So this is the surface that I'm trying to restore here and calculate the different parameters on. Um, there's a tool here, you can check the surface quality. Obviously it's been already done as it's part of, uh, of the model. So I won't go through that. Um, the next step is to choose what type of restoration you wanna do. So there's different, um, different aspects of it. So you could use flexural slip, which is just a folding associated to a, a structure, flexural slip with unfaulting, uh, and then just si simple shear. In our case, we'll use the flexural sh uh, slip with unfaulting. So we'll choose that as part of the, of the restoration. So the next step is to validate the surface normal of your uh, model horizon. So if you look here, if you see here, I've got a bunch of green lines sort of uh, extended away from my model surface and these represent the normal. So this is the, the normal uh, vector of my surface and they should all be pointing up. Basically uh, these points, towards the top. If I see that there would be an error in one of the parts, I could have reversed them and then you see they are all, all pointing down. In our case, we'll keep it pointing up here because we model the bottom of a surface. If I click next here, that's the next step I need to do. And this step really is to tell uh, the software how to sort of restore the different fault uh, traces and how the, the surface is uh, moved by these faults. So you see that I have two different faults cutting my surface. So what I need to tell the, the restoration package is how uh, to link these two uh, or these, uh, these breaks into my surfaces together. So what I'll do is create vectorial links here by using that little tool and I'll click on one surface border to the other one. 
So you see it generates a bunch of vector uh, link between my two borders. And you see that it stops at the border extremity, which are marked by these uh, black spheres on my surface. So I've got one here. So basically what this, the, the software is going to try to do is go and um, clip or sort of paste these surfaces one against the other, the other by using these vectors to, to sort of uh, drive that, uh, that movement. So I'll do that again with the next one here. So you see, I have the two uh, set of vectors that will be used to restore the faults into my surface. The next step is to decide uh, the, the point of reference for this on faulting. So what I'll do is you have to select a point on, the, on your surface. So that's what the first thing I'll do here. So you see that I've selected a point here on my surface. It's shown by that uh, yellow teacher, uh, sort of, a, or what is it, a diamond, a yellow diamond here. And then I'll select the target position of the, uh, of the resulting unfolded surface. So this is where my unfold, or unfolded and unfolded surface is gonna sort of uh, end up when I do that. I'll just uh, move it slightly towards the east to uh, account for the sort of lateral movement caused by this uh, compression. Next step is to decide and tell the software um, two options here is just to say what is the main direction of the deformation of the strain basically. So there's two options here. I can let the software decide or sort of uh, figure out what is the main strain direction. Uh, it's going to calculate it. Otherwise, I could define it. So if I know what my sigma one of this compression would be, I could define it by just uh, creating a vector. So basically, Let's say I know that uh, the main strain is oriented towards the southwest. I just draw that vector here, and that is a vector that's going to be used by the software to restore everything. So we could leave it as is here, or go back to this, just because I know it works. And these are pretty much all the parameters that needs to go into uh, sort of restoring that surface. So if I click here, I'll unfold it, and I'll see really quickly what is the resulting. A surface. So if we look at the result here, this would be my unfolded, unfaulted surface. So you see what it did? It took my um, sort of folded up surface with the faults and brought it uh, flat, sort of horizontally lying here. And then you see that the gap in between the different faults were filled in. So this is the resulting. And we won't do much. There's not much to do with that sort of flattened surface uh, for the moment, besides just to validate if the, the process worked. Uh, properly. Um, if you see sort of overlapping of uh, these two segments, or if you see that the shape of the surface has a weird um, sort of geometry, that could be due to an error into the parameterization of your, uh, of your unfolding um, workflow. Uh, the neat thing uh, is then when we look at uh, the original surface, which is this one here, it now comes with a whole bunch of properties. So these are all calculated properties on that surface. If we look at a normal, just a normal surface, oops, sorry, this one has been. So if we look at a normal surface, uh, for a normal surface, you'd get X, Y, Z, which, is, which are the coordinates of the nodes, and then you'd get the normal vector here. Um, but then when, once we've restored the surface, you see that we've uh, added a whole bunch of different new parameters to our uh, original surface. Um, most of them have to do with how uh, things are restored. So if I look here, yeah, I've got the U and V space. This is a 3D space that's used uh, to uh, model the deform environment. I've got something here named uh, distance default. So this is basically the distance default that we use for the restoration. Um, I've got the restoration vector here, which is the direction which uh, the surface has been moved and restored. Uh, I've got the restoration dilational um, property. This is something that we'll use a little bit later in the display of our uh, of our results. I've got the strain that's calculated to how much strain and what are the main directions of these strains to actually move the surface from being flat to uh, the folded shape. A bunch of curvatures, uh, the deformation, so how much deformation occurs on my surface to make it from flat to where it's at now. Um, so these are all new uh, properties that are really useful. So uh, one of the key thing actually is the dilational property here that we can see. I'll just uh, change the color scheme really quickly so we can sort of have a better look at it. So I'll use, uh, um, so I'll use this color scheme and then I'll just move the histogram uh, slightly just for better visualization of our results. Go still slightly. 
Uh, I think that's something that could work. So here we go. So basically what we see here on the surface are areas that have that show high dilational and areas that show high compressional um, to, in order to make it sort of flat again. So um, in red on that surface are area where there's a high level of dilational uh, constraint. And in that tan color is where there's high compression um, on the surface. So that's calculated from how it goes from flat to where it's at right now. So that's something of interest. Basically, we could use the dilational zone as areas where fluids could have moved to just because they uh, mostly represent areas of low pressure on that surface. Uh, so if you have fluids uh, coming in from beneath, they'll be channelized to these dilational zone. Um, and then they're probably going to be chased out of the compressional zone, zone just because of the pressure differential. So that's one thing that could be useful for exploration. Uh, the other thing is actually uh, in the strain analysis that's conducted on the surface. So if I look here, I displayed the strain. Um, so the deformation strain on my surface. So if I zoom in into like a little, little small patch here, this is actually is still pretty big. This is what I would get. So you see here on the screen, these small uh, two axes. So I've got two axes that are being displayed at the moment um, and different colors are shown. So the long axis is direction of the main, um, of the major axis of the deformation and the minor axis is the small one. So if I show both of them, this is what I get. So you get the main axis here, which is a long line and the small axis would be the shorter line. So here we go, that's what we were seeing. Um, and then, the uh, sort of uh, or the strain setting, if they're extensional uh, strain axes, they're shown in green. And if they're compressional strain axes, they're shown in red. So that's something that starts to be interesting because it can be related to sort of the different fractures that could be created by uh, these strains. So I'll just uh, make them sort of slightly bigger now. Uh, this is what we get. So it's a bit hard to read as, as it is right now. Uh, but we can play around with different properties in order to display them and see something a little bit better. So if I could really just uh, go back to structural 101, um, if we have a deformation ellipsoid here with a sigma one sort of going uh, here on the short axis, sorry, I didn't move that. And then we have the long axis of the sphere here. Uh, basically, uh, the veins would form parallel to the, um, the short axis, be basically because this ellipse is being squished from top to bottom here and the extension is going left to right, that would mean that the openings are created along the minor axis here. And if we have an extensional where we're pulling uh, the sphere up and down, it actually, the strain changes. And again, the veins would be formed or fractures would be formed along the short axis or parallel to the short axis. So what I can do now is basically just display the minor axis here. So that would account for what is being uh, the direction on which the veins would be formed during the, during the, this event. And if we keep this here, this would be um, areas where we have uh, dilational, high dilational on the surface. So basically areas where fluids could be channelized. And then we have as the uh, green lines here, these would be the direction of um, of the veins formed by such uh, the formation here. So it's a really nifty little tool if you're working in an area that's sort of green field or doesn't have any or a lot of structural data information. You could basically model up your surfaces or your contacts, uh, restore them and see how uh, veins could be formed in these environments and use that as an exploration tool. So the other thing we can do is do the same thing but for com the compressional veins. So what I'll do really quickly is I'll just copy over the same um, surface. I'll copy your properties as well. Here we go. Um, I'll display the property here. In that case, though, we'll show the veins that are formed by um, by uh, the other setting here by a compressional sort of setting area. So what we see here are two different. Uh, two different lines on my surface. Uh, you see that, uh, as I said, the uh, green lines would be the fractures that are generated uh, during the formation in dilational area. And the red lines would be fractures that are generated during the compression. So again, during the formation, but along um, the compressional um, areas of my model. 
So if you were to explore for vein type deposit, um, these are areas that could sort of you start exploring. And you could add that sort of modeling, that modeling exercise to your overall, overall targeting uh, exercise. So if you had soil data or rock chip data or right, just plain exploration data with some value for, uh, for the metal you're looking for, you could combine that into uh, this surface model to help and understand how um, the different deformation could have affected the, the, the geometry. And if we go here, if we zoom into that area, you see that this is a sort of a fracture field that's generated by the compression because this area of the surface has been uh, deformed the most. And then you see there's a set of, uh, as expected, there is a set of vein that's parallel to the main structure, which is a fault here. So that's something you can expect. Uh, same as in the damage zone that's located above uh, the main, sorry, it's this fault here, so above the main fault. So if you were to explore for, again, vein type deposit, uh, my guess would be that this area could be a good one, um, just due to the structural modeling that's been done. So again, that's an example from a really simplistic uh, sort of a geological model. Uh, the restoration tool works on numerous surfaces. So you could do that on different surfaces uh, at once. Uh, you could also sort of run that in parallel in order to uh, model different deformation event into or taking that into account for your exploration uh, project. All right. So um, I've done the same exercise using, again, another uh, small little starting uh, model here. I'll just load it up right now. So I'll load up the second one. Uh, in the other case, what we're using the structural model uh, for is not for sort of modeling the different compression and extensional areas and the, the, the fractures. What we're trying to understand is more of how uh, the subsequent, the sort of the sequence of the formation really influenced the geometry of the model. So this is again, another, uh, another sort of really quick stratigraphic model that was built into a volcanic environment. So you see that there is uh, some faults, and then we have three different horizons that have been uh, deformed and moved. In this case here, what we did is we used the structural restoration to do into the sequence of how things uh, moved uh, along the faults to try and understand how to better sort of look for um, basinal extensional features. So if I look here, I've restored my surface to um, the original here. So that's my top surface that's been overlaid. And when I deform this, this, the surface that's located underneath, this is what I get here. Okay. And then if I deform again, if I display the surface that's underneath, this is what I get. Okay. So basically, it took a top surface and brought it flat, but there's still some uh, movement needed in order to restore the two other horizons. Um, so basically, you need to, 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 to go into a sequence. Um, here, and then if I sort of bring the second one flat here, I can have the third one that's moved just a little bit again, uh, closer back to its original shape. And then if I go to the third step, it's back to the original state, uh, to its uh, flat state here. So that would be how things looked uh, before being deformed. Uh, but the key thing here are would, or would be the sort of intermediary step into this process. So uh, in our case, this would be one of the interesting one, uh, because in this case, we're looking for a possible deposit that would have occurred in areas where the basin sort of grew during the deformation. So we have the top part as lying flat here because uh, it was deposited that way. But while the top portion here was deposited while everything was flat, the underneath uh, basin sort of needed to, to open up in order to, to to uh, promote it for, for that deformation. And this is what we get here. So that could be an in the, uh, quite a good indicator of how the basin sort of evolved as it was uh, sort of filled in and then subsequently deformed. And then what we could get um, is just by using the thickness in the restoration, uh, we could find areas where uh, the basin could have been or showing growth features. So in the case of something that's controlled by uh, sort of basin growth, uh, things like DMS deposits or uh, even uh, SEDEX deposits that are sort of normally uh, formed close to the margin of the basinal growth is a 
this represents a really good tool to sort of restore the history of the basin as it's being sort of filled in and at, into its original uh, position um, here. And then we get the areas where the thickness changes would be areas where the growth faults would have existed back uh, when the basin was sort of being formed. So that's another tool that could be used into uh, understanding the geometry of things as the paleo geometry of things as they were uh, deposited and help sort of explore for uh, mineral deposits. So that's, uh, that's it for the structural restoration tools. So as I said, it's a quick little tool. It's a quick little thing you can use to sort of help uh, understand that how the deformation affected your current model and how it could help to sort of drive the presence or the location of different mineral deposits. So we'll open up for questions now if there's any. Yeah, um, thanks JP. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, go ahead, you can type them into the Q&A. Um, you can raise your hand if you're in LinkedIn, feel free to type them into the chat as well. And we did get one question, JP. Um, is there any way to consider the uncertainty and visualize it? In terms of the deformation? Yeah, it was asked around that point. Yeah, so. okay. So um, when you restore, there's no measure for uncertainty, but uh, there is a way to build it as you uh, generate your SCUA model. So the implicit model does uh, account for the uncertainty on your surface. So what you can do is sort of use these scenarios of the different geometries of your, uh, of your model and then restore one or each one of them separately in order to sort of get a wider range of possibility. Okay, we'll just uh, wait like 30 more seconds just in case. And in the meantime, um, I'll let you know that we'll see you again in a couple months on May 26th, when Sean O'Connor will demonstrate how to use GoCAD's built-in scripting to add a tool for generating geological models. Great, and I don't see any more questions. So I think that's it. Thank you so much, JP. And All right, thank you, Carla. Thank you, bye. All right. Bye.